Uh, who is chairing? Okay, I guess I will. Uh, okay, so hello everyone. Uh, today we have the pleasure to listen to Christoph Zong from um, Erlangen, and who will speak about uh, stabilization of controllable systems and application to the linearized world. Right, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be speaking at this webinar. What's, what's more, uh, with a really international audience, so it's very exciting for me. Um, for, for the talk today, uh, I've chosen to continue what seemed like a series in stabilization for PDEs. As two weeks ago, uh, my friend Shen Chuan presented um, quantitative finite time stabilization for the heat equation. And then last week, Professor Rafael Vasquez uh, presented boundary stabilization of some new PDE models uh, using the backstepping method. And so today, I will also be talking a bit about backstepping and how it relates to the larger issue of the stabilization of controllable systems. And then I will show how this applies to the linearized water tank system and a joint work with uh, Jean-Michel Coron, Amouri Ayat, and Xin Chen Now, regarding the Oh, is it working? Yes. Regarding the issue of stabilization for controllable systems, it's well known that for large classes of systems, we have some sort of implication that some kind of controllability is going to imply some kind of stabilizability, hence the, the existence of stabilizing feedbacks. And the question I raise in this talk is when and how can this be used constructively to produce constructive or even better explicit feedbacks? Now, in finite dimension, perhaps the, the simplest and most well-known answer to this question resides in the pole shifting theorem. Now, we, we take a uh, linear finite dimensional control system. Here, I will stick to scalar controls, even though there are appropriate generalizations for vector controls here. I'll stick to the scalar control because the water tank has a scalar control and it makes the notations a bit lighter. So now, for these control systems, if we assume that they are controllable, there's a well-known result that says that you can use a linear feedback to change the characteristic polynomial of the dynamics in any way you want. So this implies in particular that you can place the eigenvalues of the system wherever you want. And in particular, if you place them far enough to the left, it means that you can achieve any kind of exponential stabilization that you want. So it's a very powerful and universal result. And it relies on a very universal and powerful uh, result on controllable systems, which says that any controllable system can be transformed into this very particular form. So here we have a companion matrix and here a very specific control vector. So the intuition behind this is that any controllable system has this structure, uh, a chain of integrators that loops back at the end and the input acts on the last component and then the action of the input just climbs back up the chain of integrators. Now, this doesn't generalize that well to, uh, to infinite dimension, because in infinite dimension, uh, there are really wildly varying spectral behaviors, whereas in finite dimension, all spectra are topologically equivalent. So one can expect that linear feedbacks are not going to be able to transform any spectrum into any other. And moreover, the canonical form does not really generalize well to infinite dimension. But actually, if we go back to Brunowski's work in the 70s, the main idea in his work was not really the canonical form. The canonical form was actually kind of a very powerful tool that he found uh, for his study. But what he was studying actually is something that he called feedback equivalence, here F equivalence. And the idea is that if you have a system, a control system, the question is, can you find a feedback such that the resulting closed loop system is equivalent to another given control system? And this is summarized in these two equations here. And these two equations, they will be uh, generalizable to infinite dimension because they are just operator equations, right? So this is more generalizable than the canonical form. Right. So, and in this, in this form, it's interesting to look uh, in particular at the first equation, because if we look at the first equation and forget about the, the second equation, which has to do with drift terms in a way, the first equation is just a conjugation relation. And now, if you imagine that you have chosen A tilde to be a stable matrix, that is 
a matrix with negative eigenvalues, then you find that with this conjugation, A plus BK is actually also stable. So this points to the fact that we could recast the stabilization problem as that of establishing a potentially weak F equivalence of our control system with a stable system. And that solving the F equivalence equations for specific choices of A tilde could lead to constructive or even explicit feedbacks. Right? So this is, this is not really new. This is just a reinterpretation of some old ideas. But now I'm going to show you how with certain choices of A tilde, we can recover some well-known stabilization methods. I will start with the Gramian method. The Gramian method is a well-known method to build feedbacks uh, for controllable systems using the Gramian matrix and some of its variants. So it was developed in finite dimension, then generalized to the infinite dimension, generalized to the case of unbounded control operators, for example, most recently. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to focus on finite dimension and I will start from the F equivalence equation, which is written here, with a very particular choice of A tilde, which is A star minus two lambda I. And I'll just work on this equation. And in the end, the Gramian matrix is going to emerge. So the way we do it, I'll first replace A tilde with its value. And now we notice that in this equation, we have some form of underdetermination. We have two unknowns, but only one equation. So this points to the fact that we can allow ourselves to add a second equation to resolve that degree of freedom. And the way we're going to choose the second equation is by noticing that there's some form of symmetry in this equation, more particularly in the left-hand term. There's a form of symmetry because we have A star on the left, A on the right, but now in the right-hand side, we don't have that kind of symmetry. So what we might want to do is try to add a second equation that is going to make the second-hand term symmetric. And the natural choice for that would be to change K here and replace it by, so here I put a minus, it's just a, a choice, but it doesn't change anything at the end. Um, replace K by minus B star T star. And now we have something symmetrical, T B, B star T star. And now that I've given an expression of K uh, as a function of T, what remains to do is to solve this equation here for T. And the way I'm going to do this is by assuming that T is invertible and that it's symmetrical. And that way now, we can multiply this equation on both sides by t minus one so that we end up with all the t's on the same side. And now we can exploit the symmetries of the equation. We will multiply on both sides by an appropriate exponential here so that actually the left-hand side is just the derivative, the time derivative of this matrix here. And now all we have to do is integrate from zero to plus infinity and we get an expression for t minus one. This interval is going to converge if we choose lambda, well, if we choose lambda large enough. And what we recover on the right-hand side is actually the Gramian, the stabilization Gramian matrix. And we know that it's invertible because the controllability Gramian is invertible because the system AB is controllable. So it's invertible, so this is good. First, first checkpoint. And then the second checkpoint, we have to make sure that we actually have ended up with a symmetric matrix. And that is the case clearly here from the expression of the integrands. So starting from uh, an F equivalence type reasoning, we end up with the Gramian matrix. And now we can interpret it as a transformation of the control system into another well-chosen stable system. Uh, we can do the same thing with pole shifting, except this time we take A tilde to be A minus lambda I, and we don't uh, use the adjoints anymore. Now, if we look at the conjugation equation here, Right, we might want to put AB in canonical form, right, and then just pass the invertible matrices here on the other side. And now what we have is on the left-hand side, we have a companion matrix, the, the very specific form uh, of matrix in the canonical form. So now we're looking for an invertible matrix here that is going to put A minus lambda I into canonical form. And one way to find this is by remembering that A minus lambda I for well-chosen lambda, uh, A minus lambda I B is a controllable pair. So we can put it in canonical form with the matrix Q. And this gives us a solution for T, right? P T minus one should be equal to Q. So this gives us T, T is Q minus one P. Now one might wonder, we have started here with an underdetermined equation. We have found a solution. And actually we have done this by implicitly using a second equation to resolve the degree of freedom, just as we have done the Gramian case. 
And to find the second equation, well, we have to remember that we have used the canonical matrix, you know, the canonical form. And the canonical form relies on a very, very specific form for the control vector here. So we can try to apply T to the control vector and see what happens. And we end up quite straightforwardly using the relations here with TB equal B. And actually this very simple identity, so it's the second equation that we add to this underdetermined equation, and it has a general role. Now, if we take any A tilde, right, we don't take it to be A minus lambda I anymore. If we just consider the general F equivalence relation, if we just look at this equation, the problem here now is that the left-hand side is linear, but the right-hand side is bilinear. And we might want to make the right-hand side linear as well, because a linear equation should be simpler to solve. And TB equal B does just this. If you inject it into the first equation, you end up with the first equation that is completely linear in T and K. And actually what we have done here is just recover the, the full definition of F equivalence in the particular case where the new control operator is equal to the old control operator. And because this is F equivalence uh, from Brunowski's work, we already know that in finite dimension, there is a solution as long as A, B and A tilde B are both controllable pairs, right? Because they're F equivalent. So this is in finite dimension, but now comes the question, can, can we use this in infinite dimension, right? Is, is this uh, existence and uniqueness result for the solutions of this set of equations, is it also valid in infinite dimension? And as it turns out, uh, backstepping is kind of an answer to this question in several cases. If we look again at the basic example of PD backstepping as presented by Miroslav Kristic on the wave equation, and as was also presented last week by Professor Vasquez, so we take the unstable heat equation here, and the goal is going to transform it with an invertible transformation into this exponentially stable heat equation. Right. And so this is actually just F equivalence. We're looking for a solution T and a feedback K, right, of these equations here. But the way this is done in traditional backstepping is that we postulate a very strong ansatz for T. We suppose that it's a Volterra transformation. This is very specific, and it's also very powerful because T is automatically invertible. And what's more, if you do the calculations, you find that any Volterra transformation of this kind is automatically going to satisfy this identity, B star T star equal B star, which is just the, the adjoints of TB equal B. So actually by postulating this ansatz, we automatically get the second equation. We know that we have an invertible transformation. So all we have to do now is inject the ansatz into this linear equation here. And in the case of the backstepping for the heat equation, this yields uh, a linear PDE in the kernel, which can be solved completely exp explicitly as was shown last week by Professor Vasquez. And so this is why it yields an explicit feedback here. So, now we can begin to see the relation of backstepping with F equivalence, right? But we, uh, there's an important remark to make here. We still have that same idea of transforming systems to other systems with a well-chosen stable target system. But the difference here is that there's no controllability assumption in traditional backstepping, right? There's no canonical form. It doesn't look like the Grimian at all. And actually the controllability assumption here is replaced by this very strong ansatz for T. Right? It's so specific that it automatically simplifies these F equivalence equations and it makes the controllability assumption unnecessary. But now the question is, well, maybe now that we know about this trade-off, uh, maybe we can weaken the ansatz for T. So that means look for more general transformations, but maybe seek the help of some sort of controllability assumption. And now this strategy, this uh, new variants of backstepping has already been used uh, in different settings. It, it's been used on integral differential hyperbolic equations. It's also been used on the linearized bilinear Schrodinger equation. And this is also what we used to stabilize the linearized water tank system. So now we can move on to the water tank system in itself. The water tank system models a water tank where we assume that the length is much uh, greater than the width and the depth of the water so that we can model the behavior of the water inside the tank with 1D equations, with the Savinoy equations, so the shallow water equations. 
And here our control is simply the force that we apply to the tank in the, in the direction of its length. And it's modeled by a scalar control here in the second equation. Now for this system, there's a well-known result from 20 years ago that is due to Jean-Michel, I think, which is that the, the full nonlinear system is locally controllable around uniform steady states. But now the, the method we, we have for stabilization, it works on linear systems. So the first stepping stone would be to try it on linearized systems. The problem is uh, when you linearize the water tank system around uniform steady states, you obtain a system with an infinity of uncontrollable trajectories. So the first step is actually to rather linearize this system around non-uniform steady states, which corresponds to a constant acceleration. So physically what happens is that the tank has a constant acceleration and the water forms a stationary slope inside the tank. Now around these non-uniform steady states, uh, we obtain this linearized system, still with the scalar control here in the second equation. And now on these linearized systems, we have obtained the following results uh, for an acceleration that is not too great. And for a reasonable exponential decay, we can provide an explicit feedback law that will stabilize the linearized water tank around the corresponding steady state. Now, there are some remarks to make about this result. Maybe the first remark here would be that here, the exponential decay we can achieve seems to be limited by the acceleration of the water tank, right? The greater the constant acceleration of the water tank, the smaller exponential decay we can achieve. Now, this could make sense physically, right? Because with a great acceleration, the slope is, uh, is even steeper. And it might be that it's too unstable to hope for arbitrary exponential decay. But in our proof, this appears uh, for technical reasons. So we're really not sure if there's anything profound behind it or if it's just a technicality. The second remark is that the feedback we provide has a special form. It's, uh, we can say that it's in proportional integral form. And in other words, we have obtained it by performing a dynamic extension of the system. So the feedback is actually given here by an integrator loop. All right, we have a U2 function and the derivative of the U2 function loops back with the first uh, control component here. So it's a bit more complex than a simple linear feedback, but still, even though there's this integrated loop, we are able to give the coefficients of this linear form F1 gamma here completely explicitly using the spectral properties of the water tank system and the coefficients of the control function. Now, why uh, did we have to perform a dynamic extension of the system? Well, we had to do this because of the conservation of mass, right? The way we control the water tank does not allow us to add water into the tank or to spill any water from the tank. And so to apply this method of stabilization of controllable systems that I've described with F equivalence, we actually have to work on the system a little bit. So now we write the system in vector notation. And with this operator here for the system, we notice that there is an eigenvalue equal to zero. So that means there is an invariant for the dynamics on which the control function here that we have is not able to act, right? We when we move the tank, we suppose that we're not able to spill water or add water inside. So um, the way to sidestep this uh, is to simply add an artificial component into the controller. And in that way, we have a chance of maybe controlling the full system. Right? But now there's a caveat, which is that the mass of this new virtual system is no longer conserved. So we will have to pay close attention to that when we have to give the final feedback for the physical system for which mass is conserved. Now that we have our potentially controllable system, we have to decide on which target system we're going to choose for backstepping, right? right? Which system we want to prove that the water tank system is F feedback equivalent to. And we have found after trial and error that the only system that seems to work is uh, the water tank system with dissipation at the boundary, right? Traditionally in backstepping, uh, what we usually encounter is a target system with the damping added inside the domain. But here it didn't seem to work. And this might be due to the fact that there's a coupling inside. We don't know for sure. As, if, as for the constraint on the exponential decay, it might be a technicality. It might be uh, something more profound. But for now, we haven't figured it out yet. Now that we have both our target system and 
our modified virtual system, there's a first important and difficult lemma, which is to prove that we can find an artificial component for the controller to add here so that both the modified water tank system here with virtual mass evolution and here the target system are both controllable. And this is done using a sharp moments method and sharp estimates, and it relies on the uh, asymptotically linear growth of the spectrum of the water tank system. Now, once we have done this, once we have these two controllable systems, we can apply the ideas of F equivalence and backstepping. So we're going to try and build the invertible transformation. Right? We're trying to solve the F equivalence, and we're going to start with T. And to make our life easier, we're going to inject the second equation TB equal B so that we will be working here on the linear equation. And now this linear equation, we're going to apply it to the eigenvectors of A here. And we're actually going to build the invertible transformation T here on this basis of eigenvectors. And when we write down what this gives us, this gives us a family of ODEs. And because they're linear, we can solve them easily. And we obtain this expression here. And now the important thing is that the part in blue here actually constitutes a Ries basis of an appropriate space. And this is obtained thanks to the controllability of the target system. So here, the controllability assumption really plays a key role in proving the invertibility of the transformation. So now what, this, what we obtain after all these calculations is a simple growth condition on the coefficients here so that all of this defines an invertible transformation. So now what we have to do is that we have to find an appropriate feedback that satisfies this growth condition and such that we really satisfy these two equations. So the way we do it is that we test the isomorphism, but we test it on the, the real F equivalence equation, right? We don't inject TB equal B anymore. We're, we're just looking at, the, at that equation and we'll see what comes out of it, right? We're going to test it on every function in the appropriate domain, right? And we're going to test it against every element of an appropriate basis for the state space. And because we're in infinite dimension, this is where we have to tread really carefully, and this is where it gets really different from finite dimension. We are going to take truncated sums to just um, make sure that every computation we, we make uh, has a sense. And after we do all these computations, what emerges is that the feedback K and its corresponding transformation T are really going to satisfy the F equivalence equations if and only if this convergence holds. And if we look at this carefully, this is actually just a weak version of the TB equal B condition, which is the second F equivalence notation. So all of this is really consistent. And actually, now if we process this convergence condition after some computations and using a Dirichlet type convergence theorem, so a very, um, very sharp and specific type of convergence for Fourier sums, we end up with an explicit expression for the feedback law here. Right. So here we've used a kind of backstepping method uh, um, to solve a linear equation. And in the end, we've made all the calculations in order to obtain an explicit feedback. And now we have to remember that this explicit feedback is actually a feedback for the virtual system, where you are sort of allowed to spill and add water into the system. But now we have to deduce from this an actual feedback for the actual physical system. Now we have to remember that the actual physical system is this subpart of the virtual system, right? The virtual system can be decomposed along two directions. There's the direction where you're allowed to add and remove water from the tank. And then there's the actual physical water tank here. And both are orthogonal. So we can actually decompose the system along these two directions. We can write out the feedback. And in the end, this is why we get a feedback with an integrator loop inside it. But everything is explicit. So in conclusion, uh, using the, uh, some sort of backstepping method uh, with appropriate assumptions on, um, on an extended water tank system, we have obtained an explicit feedback law that works on the physical water tank system. Uh, if we examine the growth of the coefficients of the feedback law, we find that it is not continuous on the state space, that this was to be expected because actually bounded feedback laws could not, uh, would not be able to achieve uh, a uniform pole shifting uh, which we have here and will not be able to achieve exponential stabilization. Now, as I've said before, the underlying ideas around 
F equivalents are old, uh, but they unify several um, stabilization, stabilization methods for controllable systems. And they lead to new technical developments that I think are really linked to the spectral behavior of the system. And now to conclude some, some questions, some further questions for the water tank in particular, as I've said before, uh, the stabilization speed we're able to achieve is bounded by the acceleration of the, of the steady states. But we don't know if that's a real obstruction or if it's a technicality. Uh, we also have to remember that the final goal of all this work is to stabilize the nonlinear system around the uniform steady states. So there's still a lot of work ahead for the water tank system. And also, uh, on a related note, I've, I've been saying that the feedbacks we obtain are explicit. And so this leads to the question, how do we implement them numerically? And uh, if we are able to find feedbacks for the nonlinear system around uh, uniform steady states, the question of implementation will also be very interesting to tackle, I think. And then for methods of PD stabilization in general, uh, the question of what type of backstepping do we choose? Do we choose vulture transformations? Do we choose Fredholm transformation? Do we assume controllability? Do we need to assume controllability? All of these questions are interesting and they should allow to tackle different PDE systems uh, because now we have this sort of unifying view with F equivalence. So maybe there's a way now to decide in advance uh, when we tackle a new system, what kind of backstepping we could use. And this also leads to the question uh, because the, the formulation that we have used for the water tank is mainly algebraical and does not seem to depend on the one dimensional nature of the system so much as much as with the Voltaire transformation. So maybe here there could be an opening to apply some sorts of backstepping methods for higher dimensional systems. And on that note, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So is there any question? Uh, if so, you can open your microphone and, and speak, or you can put the question into the chat and I will read it. Enrique? Uh, yeah, can I ask? Can? Yeah, please go yeah, ahead. Hello. Enrique. So uh, thank you, Christoph. So, if I understand correctly, with these transformations, you cannot say what is the decay rate of the semigroup you achieve, right? Or, or you do? Uh, we, we can actually, because uh, we decide, uh, we choose a transformation, but we decide that it's going to send our system to a specific stable system for which the decay rate is explicitly given. Uh, it's given here yeah. in the boundary dissipation. So we choose a specific mu and the mu is fixed, and then we find the transformation. So we're able to give the decay rate precisely, actually, because we decided beforehand. So then what, why in the case of the tank, then you have this, uh, there is kind of an open problem, you said, right? We don't know whether um, the slope, the decay we get related to the acceleration of the reference configuration, whether this is sharp. So. Uh, this Yes, this is because actually for our method, we needed to prove that the target system is also controllable. And with the moments method, we have found that what we need is for the decay rate to be not too great in comparison with the acceleration. Otherwise, it seems to be impossible or at least very difficult to prove the controllability of the target system. So that's, that's why we, we're really not sure whether it's a technicality or if this is really a profound reason for, for which it would not work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you say then the conclusion is that you can guarantee a decay rate, but provided the transform system uh, preserves some controllability, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then the lack of controllability could come. So is this a low frequency problem or uh, is this because of the possible existence of some again function that uh, uh, is in the kernel of the damping operator or something like this, or? Mm. Um. So normally controllability means there is some kind of observability inequality. And uh, yeah, so for instance, this was the work of the thesis of Lionel Rossier, right? Where, I mean, he could do it, but there were exceptional cases in which there could be eigenfunctions uh, mm. in the kernel of the operator 
but this is a low frequency problem, right? In the case in which you can reduce the controllability property to excluding that there is some eigenfunction that uh, vanishes, right? On the, on the relevant projection. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's interesting. I, I think here it's it, it could be also a, a frequency, a low frequency question as well, because the the way gamma intervenes here, it's in I think the boundary values of the eigenfunctions, and we need to be able to control the boundary values of the eigenfunctions away from zero. And if the acceleration is too great and the the damping is also um, uh, too great, then we're not able anymore to make sure that the the um, the boundary value of the eigenfunctions are, are not too small. And this prevents us uh, from um, proving a moment's estimate, which is an observability inequality. Yeah, but then, then in that case, maybe what, what this will mean is that maybe there is a, a, a possible sequence of critical values rather than a smallness condition, right? So, so maybe be, the yes. smallness condition is just a way of avoiding all of them but uh, well, in the in the work of Lionel, it was more like uh, for I think it was KDV. You linearize, and then yep. you look to the length, and it was all lengths were okay except for a sequence or something like this, right? Yeah. Um, so this is interesting. There there might be a sharper criterion here. It's true that here we have taken this uh, inequality to really get some margin, right? But it, it might be that it's something much sharper than this, and that would resemble the the KDV. A critical length problem. Yeah, in the sense, yeah. well, of course, all this. I mean, I, I really don't uh, didn't follow the details. I mean, this should uh, require a much more careful analysis. But but yeah. in principle, due to the hyperbolicity, one would expect that information is propagated. Uh, but of course, uh, there could be exceptional cases in which, eventually, after the propagation that is uh, that occurs along characteristics, you don't match well. The, the opposite boundary conditions or something like this, or by yeah. the contrary, there is some kind of of lack of uh, yeah separation of both. So yeah, that's this is very interesting. Yeah, we 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 would definitely look into that. Yes, to get some sharper results on this question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank thanks. You. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean Michel. I think you got a question. Uh yes, I, I have a very, it's very very nice talk. First, I want to congratulate you. I want to, because the, the feedback law is complicated in the sense that it requires as a, the knowledge of the, the function h and v on the full interval. So it would be interesting to construct some observers. So I was wondering if it's known that uh, if you measure only the height of the water at the boundary, the system, the linear system is observable. I was wondering yeah. if it's known or not. Just with the, well, so I, but not zero. Uh, for, for, I, I don't know, but uh, this is a, this would be an interesting question as well. Uh, I, I don't know what, uh, if maybe Shankwana or Maria have seen this. Uh, it, I don't remember anything like this, partial observability of the of the water tank. That's very nice talk. Very nice talk. Thanks. Uh, okay, so next, uh, I just want to, to tell you that there are some questions in the, uh, in the ah, chat. Yes. So there's a question from Morgan Morancé. What do you think concerning only the approximate controllability assumption? Um, so now, uh, at, at the beginning, I thought that maybe it wouldn't work at all with the approximate controllability. But actually, now that we that now that it's become clearer to me that in these methods, what we have is a trade-off between what you assume for the controllability and what you assume for the transformation you're looking for. It might be that in this case or in other cases. If you want to assume only approximate controllability, what you have to do is maybe find some sort of uh, assumption on the um, on the transformation t, which would not be as strong as t is uh, t is a Volta transformation, but maybe something in between, right? And this this could be adapted uh, to deal with approximate controllability. But for now, I don't have any concrete example of how that would go. And actually, I think there are examples where approximate controllability is sufficient. Uh, just with general transformations to obtain invertibility. So, yeah, this this is quite open for now. Okay. Uh, well, thanks. So, Morgan, say thanks. And uh, there are two other questions uh, from so one from Vinbo. 
is there a controllability or accessibility condition to check for PDE? And compared to finite dimensional system, is there a condition to check whether a PDE system can be linearized? Um, so um, regarding the first question, uh, is it, could you be a bit more specific? Um, because from what I understand, what, what we have done here for the water tank system is that we're really at the beginning, we have had to really check the controllability. Like one, one big part of the work is to really prove controllability uh, in order to be able to proceed with uh, what we call the backstepping method here. Right? So th this is really something that we have to check indeed. Uh, for the second question, um, uh, I, I would like to know maybe what you mean more specifically when you say a condition to check whether the PD system can be linearized. Uh, do you mean that maybe uh, we, we have to be careful that the linearized system is controllable? Uh, yes, but it's a part of the linearized, I mean, um, I mean, you, uh, you remember in finite dimension systems, um, there is a, 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 a term called exact uh, feedback linearized linearization ah, ah, okay. yeah i ah, mean yes. can, there is such a similar thing in pde um well uh, okay ah so i had understood linearization differently so you mean feedback linear uh, linearization oh. static or dynamic yes. feedback linearization so this yes. this is actually closer to uh, historical backstepping that the first way backstepping was introduced um, this has been done for PDEs, yes, uh, in, in, in some works by uh, Jean-Michel Courroux and Brigitte d'André Novel, among others, I think, for uh, earlier beam systems. And in that case, indeed, you find a feedback that really uh, deals with the nonlinear terms and results in a virtually linear system, yes. But this is quite different from what we've done because we applied the backstepping method on systems that are already linear. So there's no notion of feedback linearization in that case. Oh, yes. Thanks. Okay, can you type to the keywords in the chat box later? Uh, I didn't quite follow what, 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 the, the name you, you said. Um, yeah, I, I, will, I will just add it here. Thanks. I think there's uh, there are several different papers on, on this. Uh, on these kinds of results for different uh, rotating beam models and they use some kind of feedback linearization, I think. Um, yes, were there other questions? Uh, uh, yes, uh, question by uh, Huai Min Yun. Um, so can one make a change of variables to obtain the internal damping effect? Um, so we have tried to do this actually, we, we because it's uh, the, all the calculations worked better with the uh, the boundary damping, and so we thought that maybe we can make a variable change to obtain again an internal damping in the target system. But the thing is, it doesn't commute with the backstepping transformation, and so actually we don't get an equivalence here. And I think the reason it doesn't commute is because we have this internal coupling, right? So we we cannot. And this is actually, this can be seen if you're trying to make the, um, to make a variable change, theoretically it exists to transform the, the system with boundary damping and the system with internal damping, but it's going to be very complicated. Uh, actually, when I, 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 I had first obtained the results on the single transport equation in 1D, and in that case, the variable change to go from internal damping to boundary damping is just multiplying by an exponential. But this is no longer the case for the water tank system because of the coupling terms. So uh, that's why we had to stick with the boundary damping. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think there's one more question from Sharshendu. Um, optimal On time optimal for time for transport equation with an integral term. In fact, I'm not sure to understand the question. But... I mean, maybe the question is, do I know this paper? <laughs> I know. Yeah, I yeah, you have really Yes, you have I, referred I, the paper. Sorry, excuse me. I think you have referred the paper here because of the where the backstripping is used in kind in the corresponding in your slides for finite time stabilizations. So in that time, it's referred that it is this proved the controllability with the time t greater equal to l. 
Um, I, yes, yes it, it is uh, indeed uh, the paper I referred to in one of my slides. Uh, I think though, but I might be mistaken, I, I don't remember exactly, I think this paper deals with boundary control, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is in the boundary control. Yeah. Uh, and, and the back so, thing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, well, what's remarkable about this paper is that they also use a general transformation, a Fredholm transformation, so with a general kernel, and they prove that it is invertible uh, using the controllability assumption, but not explicitly. I mean, in our in our work here with the water tank, we have to translate the controllability assumption into um, an, an inequality on the coefficients in the spectral expansion. So this is very quantitative, and we really has to use, we really have to use this quantitative inequality. Uh, in order to prove the inversibility of the system. So it goes um, down two different paths here, I would say. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we could have done it differently for the water tank. It's also definitely worth exploring whether this, our, our work can be simplified in this respect. And it, will, it would also shed some light on some profound theoretical questions on that matter. Uh, I, th I think Amori and Shenkwan, you raised your hands, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. So, so maybe Chen Kuan, he was waiting for a long time. Yeah, I, I get a question about the one dimensional wave equation. So you see that the, this kind of dumping on the boundary is like the dissipative boundary condition for the wave equation. So you think that this kind of strategy works the same for wave equation? Um, it, it's probable that it would work, yes. Um, I think we've, I cannot move in the slides anymore. Uh, this is, um, Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, <clears throat> yes, in, in a way, what we have done here, uh, one way to think, uh, one way of thinking about the system is that, so with the water tank, we have two systems, but, but we can actually put them uh, next to each other uh, in that way or in that way. And in that case, what, what this means is that we have, um, we have a hyperbolic, one single hyperbolic equation, uh, albeit a complicated one here. And uh, there's a, a damping transmission here. So it's not periodic there. It's periodic, but with a uh, boundary damping. And I think, uh, I, don't, I don't remember where this intervenes, but I think at some point we had to take a second, a corresponding second order, second order operator uh, for some of the calculations. Uh, but so yeah, in summary, I, I think this method could also apply to some wave equations. Right, but then uh, some wave equations with uh, uh, with additional terms or couplings or, or things like this. Uh, this yeah. could be a the boundary dissipation could be a way to avoid uh, when complicated things happen inside. Avoid mixing the damping and the and the couplings and stuff. Yeah, thank you. Or I even, or even uh, now now that I think about it, actually, if we take the water tank. And we rewrite it on a single line. What we have is actually a non-local hyperbolic system. So when when dealing with internal control of non-local hyperbolic systems, if we want to use the the backstepping method, then putting the the damping at the boundary could could be a way to deal with non-local terms inside the domain. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, be interesting. Non-local hyperbolic transport of wave equations. Yeah. Yeah. Could be interesting. So I, I also get a very technical problem. It's like for you, slide 12. Slide 12. Uh, slide 12. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you see that there is something like B star, T star equals to B star. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, you, you have a reference for that or? I, uh, no, I, th this is just something I checked myself. Uh, yeah, great. <laughs> okay, okay. You go. It's just that B star here, right? Uh, you take a function and it gives you the boundary value at one. And okay. T star, if you, if you make the computations, T star of V is V minus the integral from X to one okay. of the... Here. And now if, if you apply this here, you take the value at one, of course, this is going to, the, only this term is going to remain, the integral is going to be zero, right? So what this gives you is that if you apply V star T star to V, then you find V one, and this is just V star V. Well, this is a very excellent observation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I think there's question. also a question by Amory Ayat, but- that's, uh, that's, 
please make it fast because thank you it's a very fast question me. and uh, much less uh, deeper and technical um, do you think this freedom transform approach could be applied to some um, two-dimensional problems even like even for the transport equation um so i th this is my hope <laughs> um uh, on, on general domains uh, the thing we would have to be careful about is that we rely heavily on on boundary conditions at some point to um, to obtain the expression for the, the feedback. Uh, and so we would have to see if uh, it, it would only work for specific boundary conditions, right? And also right. as um, uh, as an echo to the remark Sheng Fan made two weeks ago, um, the kernel equations in higher dimension might be more complicated to solve as well, right? Okay. So we would have to see, I, I think maybe it, it has to be something like the boundary conditions should allow for nice spectral properties of the underlying problems in higher dimension. And if that is the case, then there, there might be a way forward with this. Thank that you. would be my takeaway at the moment, but yeah. Great. It's definitely and worth looking was, into uh, it. Yeah, it was fast, so uh, <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. So That's thank it. you very much, Christophe. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, so it was a pleasure. And well, let's jump to, to Cyril. Je pense que vous voyez mon écran. Oui, yes. Ok, je vais le mettre en plein écran. Euh, um, so, ok, we will continue this uh, session with Cyril le, le tweet. Uh, please close your microphone for those who have opened it for the questions. And so Cyril will speak about controllability of subelliptic PDE. He is coming from the Ecole Normale Supérieure at Paris. Well, thank you, Cyril. Okay, so thank you very much for invitation. So I'll talk about controllability of subelliptic PDEs. And so uh, we consider a linear PDE of one of the following types. So either Schrodinger equation or the wave equation and uh, posed in a bounded subset of Rn with uh, non-empty boundary and Dirichlet boundary conditions. And uh, we fix omega to be an open subset as usual in control theory, and we fix also time t. So the question of controllability is uh, given any initial datum u initial and any final target u final, is it always possible to find f supergene omega uh, such that the solution to the PD with initial datum u initial is equal to u final at time t. So very importantly, uh, f is super in omega. And the answer to this question, uh, of course, depends on omega on t. And we have to say in which spaces u initial and u final and f live. So uh, by the well-known uh, Hume me method, uh, controllability is equivalent to observability. So I recall the observability inequalities uh, that are different from sh for Schrodinger and waves. So for Schrodinger, given t and omega, we say that observability holds if there exists c, such that for any solution of the free equation, there holds that the initial energy is bounded above by the energy just measured in zero t times omega. Okay, for any solution. And for the waves, it's uh, given T and omega. We say that observability holds if there exists C such that for any solution of the free equation, there holds that the initial energy in some functional space, uh, the, this energy is bounded above by uh, DTU square uh, measured in zero T times omega. So this is just part of the energy, but in fact, you, you, it's uh, this uh, observability inequality, which, which is the right one. So in the cycle, I, I'll just consider observability, but uh, there are also dual controllability results. So in the Euclidean and Riemannian settings, the results are well known. So for example, for the wave equation, observability holds in time t in omega, in, if and only if the geometric control condition GCC holds. And for the Schrodinger equation, um, there is only one uh, sense which is uh, true. That is, uh, if GCC holds in omega for some t naught, then observability in omega holds in any time. But the converse is false, meaning that uh, observability doesn't imply GCC. 
And uh, in this talk, I'm going to investigate exactly the same uh, observability problems, but for uh, Delta, uh, the Laplacian replaced by sub-Laplacian, that is sub-Riemannian Laplacian, which is an extension of uh, usual Laplacians. And typically, this is the Laplacian in the Heisenberg group. So first, I will explain what sub-Laplacians are. Then uh, I will explain a result that sub wave equations are never observable. And finally, I will explain some results about sub Schrodinger equations. Uh, and this is joint work with uh, one joint work with Chen Min Soon and the other one with Kotil Tamano Kamor. So, first of all, about sub Laplacians, I will introduce these objects. So, this means that in the wave and in the Schrodinger equation, we will replace the Laplacian by, by these objects. So, a sub Laplacian, this is very simple. This is just a sum of squares, but you don't have the same number of, of, of vector fields than the dimension of the manifold. So if M is smooth connected compact of dimension N, and mu is a volume on M, then you take a smooth vector fields, M, where M is different from N on M, and uh, you, you, you take the, the span of these vector fields that is called the distribution, and you assume very importantly the Hermander condition that the Lie algebra, that is, the iterated Lie brackets of these vector fields span the whole tangent space at any point. So if you take the iterated Lie brackets, uh, x1 uh, bracket x2, et cetera, it gives you everything. So we define the sub Laplacian just as a minus sum of xi star xi, uh, where star is the transpose in L2 of mu, and this is equal up to lower order terms to uh, sum of xi squared. And the property is that thanks to this Hermander condition, the sub Laplacians are sub elliptic, so, uh, hypo elliptic, sub elliptic. So uh, this means that the uh, Laplacian U is in C infinity. This implies that U is in C infinity, like ellipticity, but hypo elliptic here. So um, the examples are uh, uh, two examples are the Heisenberg uh, sub Laplacian, x1 square plus x2 square, where you just got two vector fields in R3. And you take the sum of squares, and this the first one is dx, second one is dy minus x dz, and you see that the bracket is minus dz, so that uh, the Hermander condition is satisfied, and so it's hypoelliptic. Similarly, you can define just with two vector fields on R2, but with one of the vector fields which is degenerating, like Grushin example. This is dx and x dz, I, I, I put tz, but usually we put dy, but it's just to show that it's the projection of Heisenberg. So there is a singular line in this example that is x equals zero. You see that there is just one vector field remaining, and this is not uh, Riemannian Laplacian, but almost Riemannian. So, uh, but there can be uh, much more complicated relations between the brackets, and sometimes also you need more brackets to generate the whole tangent space. There is a metric associated to these uh, objects. That is, uh, since you've got uh, the vector fields x and j, you can put a metric g, which is just defined as uh, gq of v. q is a point on the manifold, v is a tangent vector, and v, you decompose it on the xj, and you write that you want to take the infimum of the uj, sum of uj squared. And you see that it's uh, exactly an optimal control problem, in fact. So if you want to compute the distance between, between Q and Q prime, you just take the infimum of, uh, of integral from zero to one to the, of the square root of the metric, computed along a path which are tangent to the distribution and which go from Q to Q prime. Okay, so now uh, there is well-known theorem by Cho and Rachevsky, which say that, uh, when the Hermann condition is satisfied, you've got a finite, uh, the distance between any two points is finite. And here it's a picture just to show that at any point you've got, for example, two vector fields in R3, and you can go, if it's twisted like that, it's like the Heisenberg group, you can go from any point to any other just by choosing well, uh, adequately your path. So first, now the first result is that sub elliptic wave equations are never observable. I will explain these results in a few slides. So the first uh, uh, slides, uh, slide is devoted to the, okay, explain the wave equation. So it's the free wave equation with uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions and initial data U0, U1 in a manifold M equipped with the volume mu. 
And so delta here, it's a sub-Laplacian, I insist. It's not, it's not, okay, it can be a Laplacian, but I will specify after that it's really sub-Laplacian and not a Laplacian. Okay, I will explain it later. later. So I fix omega measurable. And so the natural energy of the solution is just the usual energy, but you replace the gradient by the sub gradient. So sum of xj phi, xj for a function phi. So you just differentiate in the directions xj, xj. And then you can see just by integration by parts that the energy is preserved. And you put the initial norm on the initial, okay, the norm on the initial data. It's just the energy norm. So you know you measure it with a subremanent gradient. And U1, you measure it in L2 of M and U. Then the observability is this inequality, which has to hold for any U0 and U1. In the space H, I just go back. H, this is the space where uh, the gray, subremanent gray, gradient is finite in L2 norm, a kind of sober space adapted. And then, then the, we take a sub Laplacian, which is uh, just, uh, okay, this means the sub Laplacian has this form, and D is the span of the distribution. But we, we assume an unavoidable thing that is uh, the following. This assumption will say that we are really in this sub elliptic case and not in the elliptic case for which I've recalled the results. So the, 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 this sub ellipticity assumption is that the set of X in M such that the distribution at X is strictly included in JXM, this set of points where you are really sub elliptic is dense in M. This means at these points, you are not a Riemannian uh, Laplacian, but a sub Riemannian Laplacian. If this assumption is satisfied, then we've got this theorem that for any time and any measurable subset, which does not cover the whole manifold, meaning that M minus omega has non empty interior, then the sub wave equation is not exactly observable on omega in time T naught. Okay, so sub wave equations are never observable as soon as the normal assumptions are satisfied. It also works for Grushin and for the almost Riemannian case, as soon as the, the complement of the observability region contains in its interior a point on the singular line, that is a point x such that dx is strictly included in txxm. So I want to, okay, to, to sketch the proof. It's just to say that um, uh, how does one usually, I, I want to disprove observability. So how does one usually do for the wave equation to disprove observability? So if delta were Riemannian, we know that there would be observability in time t naught in omega would be equivalent to um, sorry to uh, the fact that omega satisfies GCC. And um, uh, what is GCC is just that you, you for, when you start from any point and you follow any direction, you have to enter omega in time t naught. This is GCC. Okay, that is any ray of geometrical optics or any geodesic traveled at speed one meets omega within time t naught. This is due to Bardos, Lobo, and Rauch, this uh, equivalence. But here um, we want to prove okay, that if GCC does not hold, then observability fails. This is what I will use. So, so if GCC is, is not satisfied, we take a geodesic which does not enter omega. And we construct a sequence of solutions of the wave equation whose energy is concentrated along this geodesic. Okay, the whole energy is along the geodesic. And this sequence, of course, contradicts the observability inequality because the, the norm, the energy is fixed, but the energy computed in omega is, uh, becomes very uh, small. So this contradicts observability. So there are many contradictions for this uh, sequence. And the uh, Gaussian beams, for example, or they are all almost equivalent or coherent states or WKB expansions or also propagation of complex Lagrangian spaces. Everything is uh, nearly the same idea. And uh, I just recall to finish that the geodesic here in the context I will present is the local minimizer of the sub distance that I have introduced before. Okay, so there are two ingredients for proving uh, this result for sub Laplacians. So first, I find a sub geodesic which does not enter omega within time t naught. In other words, GCC never holds because 
there exist very specific geodesics which are specific to the sub sub elliptic setting which stay very long in in the complement of of omega and secondly i proved just that the Gaussian beam construction adapts to the sub Ramanian setting um, uh, this means that all the energy concentrates near this geodesic, hence outside omega. Therefore, there is no observability. And so I proved that along any normal subramanian geodesic, that is usual subramanian geodesic, one may construct Gaussian beams. So the second point is not surprising, as I will explain, also not explicitly in the literature, but the first point uh, is uh, new. Okay, the first point, so I, I explained the two points successively. So the first point is to prove that these very specific geodesics exist. So the proposition is as follows, for any T naught, any Q in the manifold and any open neighborhood of Q, there exists the geodesics of MDG, that is M, the, the distribution and the metric, that, that is a geodesic of the sub uh, distance, which is traveled at speed one, and such that x of t remains in the small neighborhood for, for over the time interval zero t naught. These geodesics uh, look, lose very quickly the optimality, meaning that they are only uh, um, uh, minimizing over a very short time period. And the goal, in fact, uh, the, the, the way you're proving it is to see that it's true in the Heisenberg case. And then to isolate in any sub Riemannian structure a Heisenberg structure. This is the main idea. So I will explain it on Heisenberg case, and then you should trust me uh, that it's true in the general case because it's what we call nilpotent approximation, and uh, uh, which allows to go to the general case. This is where technicalities are hidden. And for example, nilpotent approximation. This is simple to understand on a on an example. For example, if you've got, you've got two vector fields, dx and dy minus x plus x squared dz, you see that around zero, x squared is just a lower order term. And so if you see such a sub distribution, you replace x2 by dy minus x dz, and you see, you, uh, you prove that the geodesics of the two uh, sub uh, uh, structures are in fact very close. So on the 3D Eisenberg case, I take a manifold, which is, uh, I will explain how these uh, geodesics can exist. So I take a simple manifold, which is three dimensional minus one one times T times T. And on it, I put DX1 and DX2 minus X1 DX3. This is Heisenberg. The Laplacian is the, just the sum of square, etc., And the bracket is minus DX3, so it's sub -elliptic. And you can prove that if you take these uh, this set of uh, of points, okay, or this this uh, this curve, this is a geodesic. For any epsilon, this is a geodesic. Meaning, you, you take epsilon sine t over epsilon, etc. And um, the point here is that you've got an epsilon in front of everything. Okay, this means this geodesic is from here is just spiraling. Uh, around, uh, along the X3 axis. And X3, this is the direction which needs a bracket to be generated. It means it's very difficult to go in the upper direction. And since you've got an epsilon, if you've got, if you fix first T, and then you take epsilon very small, you see that you can, uh, you can take this point to remain in a small neighborhood of zero along uh, during the time period zero T naught. Okay, so this is very good, and uh, this proves the result in the Heisenberg case. And this geodesic is traveled at speed one. How can you see it? It's just if you take x1 dot, you see there is an epsilon coming in front, and so it's of size nearly one, the energy uh, the, of the pass. So I just want to explain uh, what is the main reason why this geodesic exists is that you know that geodesics are projections of by, uh, null by characteristics. And this is a null by characteristic. It's just an integral curve of the uh, symbol of the of the Hamiltonian uh, of the Hamiltonian um, of uh, associated to the wave equation. So P two is the Hamiltonian of the wave equation. You take the the Hamiltonian vector field, you restrict it to P two is equal to zero, and you get the um, by characteristic equations. And the point is. To get these geodesics, you take very large momentum 
in a direction which is not in the distribution. Here it's the vertical direction. Here it's very large momentum. And if you take then just, uh, for example, Xi1, the momentum associated to the first variable to be this thing and Xi2 is equal to zero, then very importantly, since you've got uh, Xi3, which is large, you get precisely the geodesics I've written before. And you see, they do not go far from the initial point. So this is linked to the fact that it's very difficult to move in, in the up, upper direction. So I will just say about, uh, now that I have explained how to find this geodesic, I will just explain that uh, now the Gaussian beam construction is exactly the same as in the usual Riemannian setting, because you, we stay in the elliptic part of the symbol that is, these geodesics I have explained before, I've mentioned before, are live in a part where the Hamiltonian of the Laplacian is equal to one. The, the principal symbol of the Laplacian is equal to one. So you are in the elliptic setting and you can prove that the construction goes uh, perfectly well. So this was uh, quite fast, but uh, however, I, will, I want to present uh, two results about sub Schrodinger equations much more briefly. So I won't speak about sub heat, heat equations, which were mostly investigated, uh, I mean, uh, for the field of sub PDs, and mostly by uh, Bochard, Canarsa, and Guglielmi, uh, not mostly, but I mean, these were the pioneer, pioneering works, Bochard, Canarsa, and Guglielmi, and Bochard, Canarsa, and then many works uh, of, also of Koenig, for example. But here I will speak about uh, Schrodinger equations. And the first work for that was a work by, by Burke and Son. It dealt with very particular Schrodinger equation, but which was already very difficult. So this equation is IDTU minus the dx square plus x square dy square u. This is the sub Laplacian, the Grouchin sub Laplacian here. And you take it over r in t times minus one one in x times the torus in y. So this is written here. You've got boundaries in x and uh, no boundary uh, in y. It's periodic. Okay, and they prove very, uh, and uh, the observation set is uh, a horizontal band, band. I recall that the, the, the very important line is the singular line, it's here. It's because x equals zero. So the, the Laplacian degenerates. They prove the existence of a minimal time of control, which is just equal to this distance. Here, L of omega, the distance between uh, yeah, the maximal distance of a strip outside the observation set. How do they prove it? Uh, okay, existence of a minimal time. This means that below this time, there is no observability, and above this time, there is observability. So below this, this time, they, they just adapt a construction of vertical Gaussian beams and this is uh, very clever. These Gaussian beams don't go like spiraling around something, but they go straight ahead. It's quite difficult. And for proving observability uh, for large time, they do a very fine semi-classical analysis. I just want to explain how this can be understood, but very heuristically, with spiraling geodesics. You see in the Grouchin model, there are also some very tiny spirals, which are geodesics and which go along uh, uh, the vertical line, which is singular. In the wave equation, they do not disperse. The wave equation does not disperse, but the Schrodinger equation does. This means that different frequencies traveled at different speed. And in our case, I said, I have to choose very large momentum in the uh, vertical direction to get folded geodesics, spiraling geodesics. But here in the Schrodinger case, if psi y, so the momentum in the in the vertical direction is uh, very large, then the spiraling geodesics, of course, become become very tiny, very folded. They make small meanders, but they are traveled more quickly. Okay, because psi y is psi y is larger. So all in all, you can feel that geodesic starting from zero, but with different psi y, reach omega at the same time. And so this time is the minimal controllability or observability time. And with Clotilde fermanion camerer we proved a similar result, but, to, well, but with very different tools. So it's in compact quotients of groups of Heisenberg type. We used uh, non-commutative Fourier analysis, so representation theory, but this is very different from usual semi-classical analysis. 
And uh, we also constructed adapted semi-classical measures and adapted Gaussian beams. And we also found uh, a minimal time of observability, uh, which is due to uh, this uh, same phenomenon. And the last result I want to present is with Chen Min Sun. But it explains somehow how the stability effect can balance with the strength of propagation. So it contains both the Schrodinger picture and the wave picture. For that, I consider a family of sub Laplacians. This is just generalizing the Grouchin one. So this is dx squared plus x to the two gamma dy squared. And gamma is a parameter. And in the same manifold as before, so minus one one in x times the torus in y. If gamma is, in, is an integer, then we need brackets of length gamma plus one to recover the whole tangent space. So this means that uh, the, more, the larger gamma is, the more degenerated the sub Laplacian is. And I take uh, omega the same horizontal strip as before, so the observation set, and I consider the Schrodinger type equation, which is this Schrodinger equation, but with an exponent s the sub Laplacian with uh, gamma and the exponent s. So is, if s is, is equal to one half, you, take, you have the wave equation. If s is equal to one, you've got the Schrodinger equation, et cetera. And you say that, uh, as usual, the observability inequality is written here with a two of omega here. And what we will prove is that there exists a minimal time of observation. And we, uh, uh, we denote by t ob the infimum of all times where there is observability. And here is the main result, which is nearly concluding the talk. So the, I recall, the, I repeat the, the equation we consider, and we prove that there is a, 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 a threshold between S and gamma, okay? And S and gamma are written here. Uh, if S is strictly lower than gamma plus one over two, then there is observability in any time. Uh, then there is never observability, sorry. It means that there is never observability here since the minimal time is plus infinity. And this is somehow the wave case. Here, this is the Schrodinger case. S is equal to gamma plus one over two. If the, the usual Schrodinger I presented before was S is equal to gamma is equal to one. Then there is a minimal time of observability. And finally, if S is greater than gamma plus one over two, then there is never, uh, then the, there is always observability. This is, for example, the case for the Schrodinger, Riemannian Schrodinger equation. Okay, and we can also recover uh, results for the heat equation thanks to these results by abstract uh, transformations, etc. And just to finish, so there, this is uh, the, the proof is to use Gaussian beams to disprove observability for small times. And for if you want to prove observability this time, the technique is to use resolvent estimates, that is, estimates without any time. Uh, that uh, were initiated by, uh, for example, Burke and Zworski in the 2004. Uh, that is, you prove that for any V, uh, the, the, the norm of V in L2 of M is controlled by the norm of V in L2 of omega, plus a term which explain how far V if is from an eigenfunction of Laplacian gamma. Okay, so this uh, resolvent estimate has also the advantage to have consequences on damped wave equations. So we've got results on damped wave equations. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Cyril. Uh, is there any questions? So again, if so, you can open your microphone and ask directly, or you can you can put the question in, in the chat and I will read it. Uh, Chen Quan, yes. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I get a question about the first uh, result about uh, with sub Laplace. Yeah. So uh, your method, you, you prove that there's no observability. So which means you can you cannot also get stabilization result, right? Or yes. Okay. Yes, I can get uh, stabilization results. And uh, this is quite strong because since uh, we disprove observability by very smooth uh, families of functions, I think I I'm, very, I'm really far from, from knowing uh, well stabilization. But uh, I, I think that uh, if uh, you disprove observability with very smooth functions, then 
stabilization results are very good. Okay, and okay. I get another question, maybe it's a little bit technical. So it's still in the first part. You mentioned that for GCC, you get also a WKB method. Uh, can you explain yeah. where you use this kind of method? Because I think it's for nonlinear estimates. Or... No, no, no. The, uh, yeah, you can uh, WKB. Okay, I mean, this is just the small parameter here is uh, okay. When you, you, you shrink your, your Gaussian beam to the the geodesic uh, uh, it's um, it's in it's contained uh, the energy is contained in tubular neighborhood of size for example h with h uh, very small and this is uh, the semi classical parameter and you, okay wkb expansion it's it's yes it's uh, known okay, you mean more about <laughs> semi -classical sense. Okay. sorry uh, you mean more about semi classical sense okay okay yeah yeah but uh, for, for, yes i am i'm, I'm uh, I agree that it's not exactly the same, but uh, it's uh, related. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, there's a question by Christophe Zong. Please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks Cyril for your talk. Well, it was very interesting and very clear. Um, I had a question also about the first part. Uh, maybe the answer is in the slides, but I was wondering, so you just, you disprove observability for sub uh, for large class of subelliptic operators, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And I was wondering if now you have a moving subdomain, um, yeah. does this help or is the obstruction so strong that you cannot chase all the geodesics with a moving domain, for example? No, no, we, with moving domains, uh, you, you it depends uh, on uh, how fast they move, I, I think it's uh, important, but... Uh, Usually, uh, yes, uh, the, yeah, there would be more observability. Of course, you could catch the geodesics. And uh, okay, I have also addressed this question of moving domains of how to catch all geodesic of uh, of a Riemannian manifold. Mm -hmm. You can already do it for a Riemannian manifold. And yeah, it's not that thing. Yeah, it depends on the, but in this, uh, it depends on the dispersing properties of the of the underlying billiard. Um, but in the sub mm -hmm. setting, uh, the billiards in the sub setting are not really well known at the moment. But okay. It's an amusing case. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, uh, there's a question by Yuan and Guyen. So I just want to understand that the, the reason. So uh, the last part of your talk, you mentioned you have uh, the constant S and uh, the constant gamma in the in the yeah. equations. So yes. Uh, so what uh, what is the observer domain? The observation domain is still yes. uh, the same as before. So it's uh, uh, for example, it's drawn here. Yeah. It's okay. 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 Oh, and. Uh, so the so the, the geometry is still the same as in the in the in the work of uh, Birke. I mean, it's yeah, and it's just yeah that the 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 degeneracy along this line is stronger and stronger. Okay, okay, but but the the geometry is still a, a rectangle. Yeah, yeah, it's a rectangle. Okay. I mean, I, this phenomenon of balance between subelicity and strength of propagation is only illustrating on very particular families because Schrodinger equations are very difficult to handle even in the Riemannian case. So in sub-Riemannian geometry, it's not easier. Okay. Okay, when okay. I talk, thanks. Uh, okay, I think there's also a question by Belassen. Oui. Yeah. Merci, uh, Sylvain. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, is there uh, any hope to obtain observation from the boundary? Uh, I don't know because in fact, it's, uh, it's quite difficult, the boundary in sub riemannian geometry. Um, I've never done it. And uh, be, uh, why is it difficult? Uh, mainly because it depends whether the boundary is contained or not in the distribution. Is it transverse? Is it partly contained? Uh, so these questions are being investigated from sub riemannian geometers, but it's very new. And so the controllability is not clear at all. Uh, okay, so I have uh, another question. Uh, also on the on your theorem with uh, fractional uh, the fractional case of subelliptic 
Yes, this one. So here, the, the time t offs, can you characterize it or not? Is no, uh, in, in, in this case here, in this yeah. case, Burke and Son, in the case S is equal to gamma is equal to one, they characterized it. And it's uh, what I said before. But in our case, uh, resolvent estimates are in some sense uh, weaker than, and they don't allow to, to compute this time. And this is why our result is, uh, does not exactly contain the one of Burke and Son. It's, for this case, it's slightly weaker. It's a different phenomenon that we show. Uh, is there any more question? Uh, 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 yes, uh, thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, it was very clear. And my question is, if, uh, is it possible to perturb, uh, for example, the, the Schrodinger equation with the lower order term and to continue to have uh, the same kind of properties? Yes, typically uh, with the potential. Uh, I think, uh, or uh, first order term, I don't know, with potential, uh, at least it's possible in our result with uh, clotilde fermanian kammerer because if uh, in semi-classical analysis, if you if you put a non-semi-classical potential, it's it's not really seen by the evolution. So in, it's covered by our results. With Chen-Min, we have not written it, but I think it's also possible. It modifies a little bit the semi-classical analysis. The real difficulty is if you put... Uh, semi-classical potential, uh, and in this case, I really don't know. <laughs> okay, 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 thank you. Okay, so if I have uh, no other question. I, I have just uh, uh, one, uh, one yeah, question. Sure. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, thank you for, for this very nice talk, very clear, and it was very interesting. I was wondering, so you mentioned that you, you can recover some result by Boshak, Anasa, and Gubi and me. Can you get some new results with your approach? Or uh, it, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, it's a new result, uh, but it's very particular. So I can just explain in two words. So they consider the case where S is equal to one. And what they prove is something like, I'm not totally sure, but the, for gamma larger than one, there is uh, no observability. And so we extend the result to the case for different S. I mean, S is in, in, in case, I mean, they've got this result for the heat equation in case S is equal to one and we've got it for all S. But uh, yes, this is, so it, it's a bit, uh, a slight extension, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> nice talk. Well, so thank you. Thank you, Cyril, for the, this very nice talk. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so I think you, you got a question in the chat. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we will ask the speakers to send uh, the slides to, to us and we will upload them on the, on the web so that uh, you will have the, the literature page if you wish. <laughs>